no me conozca, soy Carlos Matay, soy profesor en esta universidad y dirijo el, el ITD, el Centro de Innovación en Tecnología para el Desarrollo Humano. Y, y bueno, eh, como muchas de las personas que nos acompañan saben, prácticamente todas las semanas tenemos un espacio así que hemos llamado diálogos improbables porque nos unen a personas que habitualmente no trabajamos juntas y, y nos damos eh, el, el lujo de tener un, un tiempo tranquilo eh, y abordar temas que a lo mejor no son de nuestro... Eh, digamos, dedicación profesional directa, pero que sabemos que siempre suscitan ideas, eh, nos permitan también conectar entre, entre nosotros. Aquí yo creo que estamos eh, eh, profesores de la universidad, estáis también eh, alumnos eh, de, del, del Máster en Tecnologías para el Desarrollo Humano, también estáis algunos investigadores del centro, profesionales que os habéis acercado por primera vez, creo que algunas personas, gracias por, por estar aquí. Tenemos a una colega que representa a un centro de innovación muy parecido a este en, en, en Dinamarca. Lise, gracias por, por acompañarnos. Y bueno, la dinámica es muy sencilla. Eh, eh, aprovechamos eh, eh, un tema sobre el que eh, estamos trabajando y una persona o varias personas, hoy tenemos una, una persona que ha venido de Estados Unidos, es profeso para, para esto, y eh, eh, después de su intervención tenemos un diálogo. ¿eh? Y, bueno, ya veremos cómo luego podemos eh, generar una conversación que sea, que sea útil. Nos sigue gente online, también aprovechamos a saludar a la gente que nos está siguiendo eh, desde, desde donde sea. Y, y bueno, pues eh, vamos a, a comenzar. Eh, este diálogo eh, está motivado por una iniciativa que compartimos con eh, la Organización Acción contra el Hambre, que es la revista 17, y tanto Manuel Sánchez Montero como yo somos coeditores de la, de la revista, estamos en un comité científico, y con eh, el liderazgo de, de esta organización, hace poco eh, salió a la luz un número dedicado a, al problema del hambre. De acuerdo, entonces, bueno, os animamos a, a si queréis, eh, 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 husmear en la página web de la revista, es una revista online, cada número es un monográfico que eh, a, trata un tema de, de interés general y la sesión de hoy está basada en un artículo que ahora nos presentarán al, al ponente que nos, nos interesó muchísimo y, y que creemos que puede ser la base de un diálogo muy, muy interesante y muy conectado con lo que estamos viviendo hoy. La, el diálogo va a ser en inglés, so I'm going to, to move to, to English. Thank you, John, for being here. Thanks, um, uh, Manuel. Um, if uh, anyone wants to uh, have a question, a comment, and, and prefers to do it in Spanish, Manuel or, or anyone can translate. Please don't, don't be shy. Uh, the, the, the thing is that we, we, we like to, to make this space into a conversation space. And nothing more. I think we can start. Thank you. Give me my toy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. I'm not going to destroy the toy now. Just a second. So, that's it. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you, Tom. I know it's been a long trip, a long journey. Just arrived this morning. But let me introduce you to Professor Tom, da Tom Dannenbaum. Uh, I have the chuleta. You know, a professor of international law at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in the Tufts University of Boston, researcher on armed conflict, on international uh, humanitarian law, on international crime, uh, uh, and international judging and peacekeeping, um, with several awards as professor, as teacher, as researcher. So really, it's a real honor to have you today with us. Um, the motto of today's dialogue is not related only to the current situation we live in Gaza. It's because since 2018, we have the uh, UN, UN Security Council Resolution uh, 2417, which is establishing the prohibition of using the war as a, the, the, the hunger as a war weapon. It's a prohibition that existed from before, but it's gained political momentum with several crises not only those that fundamented 
the uh, passing of this resolution, the hunger crisis in the Horn of Africa or Nigeria or Yemen, but also the conflict in Ukraine and the global food crisis last year gained a lot of political momentum and today's, nowadays, Gaza crisis. So what we would like to go through with uh, Mr. Danemon is about how this topic, this big challenge, which is not just an ethical challenge, we consider it's a political challenge, uh, which is putting the viability, the stability of our societies at stake, uh, can be met, can be addressed in a manner that we can stop this these, uh, behavior of using hunger as a war weapon. And uh, we will let him to go through whatever are the angles he wants to deal, because it's so ample that you can go through the judicial and legal angles, the political ones, or the social ones. So without more words to say, I give you the floor, and we listen to you very attentively. Thank you, Manuel, and thank you, Carlos, and thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I was teaching in Boston yesterday and took a red eye last night, so hopefully I'll sustain coherence over the next uh, hour and a half or so. So among the many challenges that we face internationally from climate change and the disaster and displacement it causes, democratic backsliding against the context of misinformation and disinformation with the accelerant of artificial intelligence or the prospect of cascading pandemics, it's clearly the case that war, its initiation, its perpetuation, and in particular here its conduct, remains one of the most profound of those challenges. As Manuel said, I'm an international lawyer, and so I'm going to think about this and frame it through the lens of international law. And international law does give us tools to respond to these challenges. They are incomplete tools. They are sometimes frustrating tools, and they are not exhaustive in terms of the response they offer. But they do give us tools, and it's important to try and think through what those tools are and whether we're willing to avail ourselves of those tools because they exist, but the challenge is making them real. I'll talk primarily about two bodies of law, international humanitarian law, which is the law governing how we fight, the conduct of hostilities as opposed to whether we're fighting in the first place, and international criminal law, which is the body of international law that underpins individual criminal responsibility, the body of law pursuant to which individuals can be prosecuted and punished. In a sense, when we think about these two bodies of law, they're subject to an obvious critique, which is they are, to a certain extent, acontextual, decontextualized. They apply regardless of underlying structures of justice or injustice. They apply equally to an aggressor as to an actor fighting in self-defense, equally to an occupier as to a party resisting occupation, equally to a party responding to violations of these very rules as to a party that's brazenly violating them systematically. They are the red lines that apply to all. Now, to a certain extent, as I said, that opens them up to critique, because if this was the only system of law we had, if this was the exhaustion of our legal attention, then we would be missing those underlying structures of justice and injustice, and potentially obscuring them through our exclusive attention to these issues of urgency once the fight is underway. So international law has to also be responsive to those, and it's not particularly good at being responsive to those. There are tools, the prohibition on aggression, rules around self-determination. There's currently an ICJ advisory opinion pending on the question of prolonged occupation in the context of Palestine. All of those tools have to also be used, but that's not what I'm gonna be talking about today. I'm gonna to be talking about international humanitarian law and international criminal law, which apply regardless of those underlying questions of justice and injustice. And although that does subject them to critique, it's also their greatest strength because it allows us a certain degree of clarity in identifying the red lines that are applicable regardless of one's views about highly contested issues of the justice and injustice in terms of who is in the right in the fight in the first place. Another way of thinking about that is these are the red lines past which you cannot cross, even if your cause is completely just, unimpeachably so. This is 
the line that sets the beyond the pale threshold for all. And we can see some of that clarity in the way that Ukraine is using the law in response to the invasion by Russia. Now, obviously, it's also pursuing accountability for aggression, this question of the underlying cause of the war in the first place. But it's also invoked every available legal tool and institution in response to the conduct of the war, whether that's mobilizing multiple interstate cases and 17,000 individual complaints before the European Court of Human Rights, including bringing along 31 other states as intervening third states in that litigation process, whether it's litigating under the Genocide Convention before the International Court of Justice, again, bringing on 32 states alongside it as intervening third parties, or whether it's creating the conditions for the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, which in that context has jurisdiction over crimes against humanity, genocide and war crimes, not the crime of aggression. Again, with support from, in that case, 42 states referring the situation to the International Criminal Court prosecutor, which smoothed the way to the investigation that the prosecutor undertook in the context of Ukraine, which, of course, a year later then generated the most high profile arrest warrant in the International Criminal Court's history, namely the arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin and alongside him, Maria Lvova Belova, the child rights commissioner within Russia, both for the deportation of children out of Ukraine and into Russia. One might look at that and think, why is Ukraine expending resources and time and energy on this? It's in an existential conflict. It is in face, it's facing in that conflict a, an adversary that is vastly more powerful. And yet it's devoting an extraordinary amount of attention, resources, and energy to invoking the law. And in particular, in the ways that I've just described, invoking the law governing the conduct of hostilities, not just the law governing the aggression in the first place. And the reason it's doing that is because that allows a framing of everything that's happening in the conflict with normative implications for everybody that relates, every state that relates to the conflict in one way or another, because it provides a focal point for mobilizing politically to generate and maintain support in various different ways, and because of the value of pursuing accountability, even when it's a far off project, even when it's a long term project, both its intrinsic value for victims of crimes, but also its instrumental value in terms of performing a deterrent effect, a deterrent effect that may even occur through the social deterrence attached to arrest warrants and investigations before we even get to prosecutions. And of course, prosecutions in that case in particular are going to be very far down the line if indeed they do occur. Although it's worth bearing in mind in this respect, these are crimes for which there's no statute of limitations and there's no amnesty. And so those arrest warrants, those charges hang over the heads of those individuals for the rest of their lives, which particularly in the case of people like Maria Lvova Belova, who are going to outlast Vladimir Putin's regime, that's a really significant implication for the rest of their lives. But international criminal law cannot maintain credibility or legitimacy if the Ukraine case is an exception, is an anomaly. It requires that these systems and this mobilization towards the application of the law applies across situations without fear or favor, whether it's Tigray or Myanmar or Gaza or elsewhere. And equally importantly, and this is going to get to the crux of our discussion right now, it's important that international criminal law be applied across the spectrum of criminal wrongdoing, not just with respect to those instances of spectacular violence that have tended to draw its attention in the past, but across the different forms of violence and the infliction of suffering that arise in armed conflict, where there is a legal basis for pursuing accountability. One of the things that we've been discussing over the last maybe two years since we've been going to conferences together is that one of the most devastating impacts of contemporary armed conflict is the impact on food security. Tens of millions of people worldwide, in many years over 100 million, suffer acute food insecurity as a direct consequence of armed conflict. And for many of them, it's not just the inevitable collateral consequence of armed conflict, 
and it's not the consequence of intractable scarcity or natural disaster. It's the product of choices about how to fight war. Traditionally, international law had not been particularly good at responding to that particular form of choice and that particular form of the infliction of suffering. Until 1977, there was no prohibition on this method of warfare. It was only in the additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions in 1977 that we first get the prohibition of starvation of civilians as a method of warfare and the associated protection of objects indispensable to civilian survival. But even then, it wasn't criminalized. It wasn't one of the grave breaches within the additional protocols. So it's only in 1998 with the Rome Statute, the International Criminal Court Statute, that in Article 82 B25, there's the first codification at the international level of the war crime of starvation of civilians as a method of warfare. That's then updated in 2019 to include starvation of civilians as a method of warfare for non-international armed conflicts. Many states now include this crime within their domestic war crimes codes, many of which include various forms of extrajudicial, uh, sorry, extraterritorial jurisdiction. That includes Spain. So in the Spanish code, I think it's section 612, paragraph eight, has salvation of civilians as a method of warfare as a war crime. So it's common across many states. It's been articulated by the Security Council in resolutions 2417, as was just mentioned in 2573, both of which strongly condemn salvation of civilians as a method of warfare, connect it to the protection of objects indispensable to civilian survival, connect it to the willful impediment of humanitarian relief and warn of its potential war crime status in any given context. So the law is now available to respond to this practice, and yet we don't see prosecutions of this particular crime. And so the first question is, why? One reason is its partial novelty and the inevitable caution of prosecutors who want to bring cases they can win and prosecuting a crime that hasn't yet been prosecuted at the international level is always therefore a challenge. Another is related to the issue of the perception of the challenge around causation in this context, which is that these particular methods cause enormous suffering, torturous suffering, social disruption, as well as individual disruption and potentially transgenerational effects. But that causal chain occurs over time and in a crowded causal context where the chain is difficult to trace. And from a prosecutorial perspective, that makes one uneasy. How exactly do I prove what's happened, what the wrong is, what's the threshold? But the third reason, and it's related to that caution, in my view, is that there's a misunderstanding about what the legal threshold is, what needs to be shown to say there are starvation crimes occurring, and therefore an unwillingness to move in part because we don't know what exactly we need to show, what exactly is the wrong. What I'm gonna to suggest to you is that the crux of this legally is the deprivation of objects indispensable to civilian survival, as opposed to the causation of a particular outcome. Objects indispensable to civilian survival here include food, water, the systems by which they're maintained and produced and potentially other indispensable objects. To be clear, the wrong, what makes starvation of civilians as a method of warfare a matter of grave concern is that torturous effect that it has on those who suffer the results. But legally, one doesn't have to show the causation of a particular act to that outcome. In my view, what one has to show is the deprivation of indispensable objects, either for their sustenance value, regardless of the outcome of that deprivation for sustenance value, or in a context where one is engaging in that deprivation for other reasons, but where starvation is a virtual certainty as an outcome. And here we can think of the concept of starvation in two ways, a transitive concept, the practice of engaging in starvation methods, which is to say denying sustenance for its sustenance value, regardless of outcome and regardless of the immediate vulnerability of those who are suffering that denial of sustenance and salvation in its intransitive sense, the outcome that one suffers at the point of starvation, the point of non-sustainability of life due to lack of food, water or other essentials. Understanding those two 
as different and both potentially meeting the threshold is important to understanding when that legal threshold is potentially satisfied. To explain why that's the right way to understand, I'm going to have to get into a little bit of technicality with respect to the law, but hopefully I'll keep you with me. And if I don't, then just feel free to ask questions. So the first thing to understand is the regime governing objects indispensable to civilian survival. Second, to understand how that relates to the concept of starvation of civilians as a method of warfare. And then third, to underpin that with the core principles of international humanitarian law and how they relate to this particular issue, because in my view, a lot of confusion arises from not understanding these things in conjunction with one another. So on this issue of objects indispensable to civilian survival, ordinarily in international humanitarian law, when you're thinking about objects and the protection of objects from attack, if an object serves a military and civilian use, what we ordinarily call a dual use object, it is as a matter of law, a military objective that is therefore a legal target. That doesn't mean its civilian use is totally unprotected, but its civilian use arises instead, or the protection of that civilian use arises instead through the principles of precautions and proportionality. Precautions requiring parties to the conflict to take all feasible measures to minimize the civilian harm associated with attacking that object, and proportionality requiring them not to attack at all if the civilian harm would be excessive in relation to the military advantage gained. <clears throat> but what should be immediately obvious from both of those concepts is that they require judgment and they're highly contested. What exactly is feasible in a particular context? What exactly is excessive in a particular context? And so it's crucial that objects indispensable to civilian survival are moved out of that framework and subject to a higher, brighter line set of protections that are not adjustable according to feasibility or excessiveness, but are clear red lines. In particular, and this is for those of you who are lawyers or who want to look this up, it's in Article 54, Paragraphs 2 and 3 of Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions, there are two bright lines associated with objects indispensable to civilian survival. The first is that it's absolutely prohibited to attack, destroy, remove, or render useless objects indispensable to civilian survival, such as food, water, and the systems by which they're maintained and produced for their sustenance value including even for their sustenance value to combatants, <clears throat> unless they provide sustenance exclusively to combatants. To put that another way, unlike dual use objects generally, which qualify as military objectives and we protect civilians through proportionality and precautions, there is no legal concept of dual use sustenance. Sustenance that goes to both combatants and civilians is not targetable on the basis of the fact that it provides sustenance to combatants. It's off the table from a targeting perspective. The second bright line is that even when objects indispensable to civilian survival are targeted, attacked, destroyed, removed, or rendered useless for reasons other than their sustenance value, Think, for example, classically of a grain barn that's providing cover to troops, and so you're targeting it because it's providing the cover rather than because it includes food. Even in that case, it's prohibited to engage in that attack, destruction, removal, or rendering useless if civilian starvation would be the known consequence of that attack. Crucially, both of these rules attach prior to precautions and proportionality. In other words, you can't do it regardless of what's feasible regardless of what military advantage you anticipate, and regardless of how that military advantage weighs against the value of those objects to civilians. They're bright lines. And that's crucial in the law of war because when we get into proportionality and precautions, there's a lot more debate around any given attack. When we have a bright line, you can't do it. It's much more straightforward. If you targeted that thing, it was illegal. The difficulty arises or is thought to arise because the specific language with respect to the protection of objects indispensable to civilian survival is attack, destroy, remove, or render useless. And there are obviously modalities of deprivation other than those, most obviously siege, obstructing the or impeding the delivery of humanitarian relief or objects indispensable to survival without necessarily attacking it, destroying it, removing it, or rendering it useless, although I'll come back to that concept in a second. And so some have argued that those things are therefore only prohibited under the general umbrella concept of prohibition of starvation of civilians as a method of warfare, and that should be understood more narrowly as really about purposively trying to cause civilians to suffer 
as a way of achieving one's war objective. I think that's incorrect and a misunderstanding of the relationship between the protection of objects indispensable to civilian survival and the prohibition of salvation of civilians as a method of warfare. In my view, the articulation that I just gave with respect to the protection of indispensable objects is just is the concept of starvation of civilians as a method of warfare that can apply to any given modality of starvation, including mm -hmm. the impediment of humanitarian relief. There are a number of reasons why I think that in terms of legal interpretation, I'll just mention a couple of them, but I recognize this might be getting a little technical in terms of how interpretation works. One of them is the structure of Article 54, which is an article that prohibits or protects objects indispensable to civilian survival mm. as its title, but then includes as its umbrella pr provision, the prohibition on salvation of civilians as a method of warfare, before going into the second and third paragraphs, which detail how that operates in the context of the protection of objects indispensable to civilian survival. The most logical way to understand that is that starvation of civilians as a method of warfare is the prohibition and a specific manifestation and exemplification of it is then elaborated in paragraphs two and three, namely the structure of the prohibitions around attacks, destruction, removing and rendering useless objects indispensable to civilian survival. That finds support in the Security Council resolutions, which mingle these concepts across the different paragraphs, objects indispensable to survival, starvation. It's consistent with understanding starvation in its transitive sense as sustenance denial, as opposed to simply an outcome that arises from a particular practice. And so one can engage in a method of sustenance denial to civilians without necessarily intending to or purposively <clears throat> causing a particular outcome for civilians. And the reason this matters, by the way, is because the claim is often, well, what we're trying to do is starve the combatants. And it just happens there are a lot of civilians there, but that's not our purpose. But if our purpose is to deny sustenance to that population, then we're already purposively mm. engaged in the transitive concept of salvation of civilians as a method of warfare. It's also reflected in the way that the war crime is structured. So the war crime doesn't draw distinction between different modes of deprivation, whether it's encirclement or attack. And there's no normative reason why there should be any difference, certainly between rendering useless or removing attack. We could get into all sorts of technical debates around kinetic action in the context of armed conflict. We're talking about removal or rendering useless. There's no normative distinction between those and impeding humanitarian relief or impeding the delivery of objects indispensable to civilian survival. And so in each of those respects, the most logical way of understanding what starvation of civilians as a method of warfare is, just is with reference to this paradigm of objects indispensable to civilian survival. So what does that mean when we're thinking about humanitarian relief? It means the first question you ask is, is the relief being obstructed for its sustenance value? If the answer to that is yes, the next question is, are civilians among the population that's affected by that obstruction? If the answer is yes, it's prohibited. That's a violation. It's starvation of civilians as a method of warfare. If the answer to the first question is no, it's not for their sustenance value, then the question is, are civilians going to starve as a result of this deprivation? And if the answer is yes, then it's prohibited on that second prong. So either it's purposive sustenance denial, regardless of what the immediate projected outcome is, or it's some other action of deprivation, but where it's known with the virtual certainty that civilian starvation would arise. You can think about this in the context of Gaza right now. So in the first instance, the initial siege, total blocking of food, water, fuel, and electricity, no exceptions, absolute. There's no way of understanding that, and particularly the name checking of water and food as other than deliberate sustenance denial. And again, it doesn't matter that that might have been with an effort to squeeze the combatants within the population because civilians are affected by that policy of sustenance denial. But even as it shifts and you start to see humanitarian aid coming in and it gets a little bit more ambiguous to understand is the aid that's not getting in because of sustenance denial or some other reason? And of course, one can have views about that, but there's at least some more ambiguity about it. Once we reach the point 
where starvation is a virtual certainty as a result of this policy, then we're in the second prong where we're thinking about the denial of objects indispensable to survival in a context in which civilian starvation is the inevitable result. It's important to understand all of this against the backdrop of the structure of international humanitarian law, which is at its base level in what's called the basic rule in Article 48 of Additional Protocol 1, the obligation of the parties is to at all times in their military operations distinguish between civilians and combatants, civilian population and combatants, civilian objects and military objectives, not just in attacks, but in all military operations. There's no way of understanding a siege or the deprivation of objects indispensable to civilian survival as anything other than a military operation. And if one can't distinguish between those who are going to be receiving the objects that would come through between civilians and combatants, then one is not doing one's job of distinguishing between those two categories of person within the population. This is straightforward and unambiguous, and nobody would disagree with it when we're talking about kinetic attacks. Nobody thinks, nobody has defended the view that if you have a population that's encircled, such as Gaza, and you can't determine who the combatants and civilians are, you can just carpet bomb the whole place and say, well, we only want to kill the combatants. It just so happens we're going to kill everybody as a way to do it. Nobody thinks that's lawful. So how could it possibly be lawful to say we can't determine who's going to get the food or water? All we want to do is squeeze the combatants. But the only way to do it is to besiege the entire population and deny them sustenance. It's equally indiscriminate. It's equally failing to comply with the obligation in all military operations to distinguish between combatants and civilians. And the effects are torturous. The fact that they take longer isn't mitigating. The fact that they take longer is what allows them to inflict this particular torturous kind of wrong, the wrong that tears at individuals' capacities to live consistent with their higher order commitments, their basic humanity. There's also a concept here that's worth bearing in mind, which is the concept of a civilian population. So in Article 50, Paragraph 3 of Additional Protocol 1, the civilian population is defined as retaining its civilian character, even when there are combatants within that population. The presence of combatants, in other words, does not deprive a civilian population of its civilian character. <clears throat> and so whenever a population is predominantly civilian, the population as a whole is civilian, notwithstanding the presence of combatants. And so any operation that's targeted at the population as a whole, regardless of its ultimate motive or goal, is an operation targeted at the civilian population. And so if one looks at starvation of civilians as a method of warfare and says, well, it really has to be a method that pursues the starvation of civilians. Well, if it's sustenance denial to a population that is civilian as a whole, even if the motive is primarily around inflicting mm. harm on the combatants within, it is still starvation of civilians as a method of warfare. So the basic upshot of this is, first of all, we need to understand that, of course, the primary normative concern with this method of warfare is the harm it causes to civilians and civilian population. But legally, we can be a lot more effective. We can have an actionable, effective and yet grounded in the law framework if we focus on the act of deprivation and the moment of deprivation and the fact that the deprivation is a policy of sustenance denial without needing to establish causation in what is inevitably a crowded causal context. And in fact, most people in famine die not of food deprivation, but of disease and various other factors that proliferate in that context. So once one gets into causation, things get <laughs> far mm -hmm. harder to establish. And from a legal perspective, that's a critical mistake to avoid, recognizing that it's about that moment of deprivation, the act of deprivation, and that's where the crime attaches. Secondly, if we're going to have a revitalized international criminal law system, one that was clearly in crisis two or three years ago, seemed to have a revival in response to the invasion of Ukraine, but is now at a point of inflection where either we do or we don't support criminal law for all, then we have to, if we want that revival to sustain, 
And even if you want it to be successful in the context of Ukraine, we have to see the same kind of energy and solidarity and mobilization of legal instruments in response to other situations, including Gaza, in this current moment. And finally, when we're thinking about international criminal law, it's not just about mobilizing the crimes that have always been there. It's about recognizing the crimes that have thus far remained dormant, understanding that salvation of civilians as a method of warfare in many conflicts causes a broader range and deeper extent of human suffering than the kinetic attacks that have traditionally drawn the attention of war crimes prosecutors and actually mobilizing towards accountability for that particular form of wrongdoing. Recognizing in all of this, that this obviously isn't the sole solution. Law is part of how we respond to these situations. Criminal law is a narrower part within that, but it is there and it's currently not being used and it can be used. And the way that I've just laid it out is the way I think it can most effectively be mobilized. So I'll stop there. I'm happy to go into detail on any specific situations. I'm sure Gaza is on many people's mind, but that's just by way of laying out the legal framework. Thank you very much, Tom. I think this already requires a uh, But I think that the, the point is that you have a dialogue with uh, people here and also uh, online. Uh, just remark two main things that you said now, which is first that, thank you, that uh, law is applicable universally. So, uh, and it's applicable also not only regarding the intentionality, but also simply the effect. An effect has not why to be a, a, a final starvation, but also all the processes that could drive to starvation or that could provoke uh, a degradation of the food security of, of uh, civilians. Uh, I think that uh, the floor is for uh, the audience to start to engage in a dialogue. I know that there were some technical uh, concepts. Don't feel afraid. I think that you can ask for something that will not be a stupid question, because many of us, we are not super technical but also make questions which are beyond the technicality of, of, of the law framework. Okay, so please. Any question in Spanish, I will translate. Sorry, so don't, don't worry. So you feel comfortable. <laughs> I'm Javi Kroos from Ideas for Change. Thank you for your talk, Tom. If I understood well, this is not only war law, but could be applied in peace as well. As long as you deny food to someone, no, you don't need uh, to attack. Just by denying, you commit this criminal uh, thing you were talking about. So it's it's above war. It's it's no. So it's there's there's two layers to this. With respect to the provision I was just discussing now, it's a war crime. And so there is an underlying armed conflict element to the crime. In other words, there has to be an armed conflict. This act has to be associated with the armed conflict. That's what we call the belligerent nexus. That doesn't need, mean it needs to be an attack. It could be deprivation of another form, but it has to have a nexus to an armed conflict. If there's no armed conflict, this provision is just not going to be available. There are, however, other provisions that could be available at the level of international criminal law. Obviously, in domestic law, there could be all sorts of provisions, but it's going to vary from state to state. But at the level of international criminal law, there are two. One is crimes against humanity, and the other is genocide. And those can attach even if there's no armed conflict. The question, though, is which crimes...
should happen for it to be applied and what could be or should be the consequences after it has been applied for these mm, choices that you also mentioned to be different choices and to stop the siege and the te uh, the techniques as warfare techniques. Thank you. Yeah, so there are different ways that one can think about the application of law in these contexts. The most obvious is prosecutorial action. So investigations, arrest warrants, and cases being brought before courts. And I think the main reason that there hasn't been action on that, well, there are multiple reasons, actually. One is just that the law wasn't available in many of the international criminal jurisdictions that we've had thus far. It first became available at the ICC, but the ICC, it was initially available only in international armed conflicts, and most of the conflicts that have occurred since that time have been non-international armed conflicts, and it only updated in 2019 to extend to non-international armed conflicts on this specific crime. We now have a couple of international armed conflicts to which it could apply, Ukraine and Israel-Palestine, both of which have starvation crimes implicated, and both of which are international armed conflicts, at least in my view, there's some debate as to whether the conflict in Gaza is a non-international armed conflict or an international armed conflict. It's a kind of technical legal debate. My view is it's international, but there is at least some dispute there. And so that would be a complication in that particular case. But the second issue, quite apart from the availability of the law, is the willingness, as I said, of prosecutors to bring cases on issues that they think are stretch issues legally, where they don't have clear jurisprudence. The legal interpretation I just articulated is my view of what the best understanding of the law is, but there are other views. And so if you're a prosecutor, you want to have certainty as to exactly what the legal thresholds are going to be. And prosecutors, particularly in courts which have where they've not been particularly successful, such as the International Criminal Court, are therefore reticent to bring cases where they don't feel there's a clear prospect of success. And the third, I think, is the degree to which this is salient in the public mind. And this may be something that's changing now. But the question of not just the application of law through prosecution, but the application of law through influence. For example, if you are supplying weapons, if your state is supplying weapons to a party to a conflict that's engaging in widespread war crimes or crimes against humanity, at a certain point, that implicates the responsibility of the supplier state and possibly individuals within that supplier state. But before we get to that legal threshold, there's also the point at which the population within that state won't stand for it anymore protests the complicity in that kind of violation. So partly it's a question of, is this particular form of violation sufficiently salient in the public mind to impose demands on their politicians to exercise their influence to stop it on the front end before we get to questions of prosecution and accountability? And I think that might be changing in this moment, but partly it's about raising awareness that, first of all, the law clearly prohibits it, Secondly, it's about raising awareness of the effects. So as I said, the effects aren't necessarily the key component of the legal analysis, but understanding the degree to which this is individually and socially destructive, torturous in its implications, is important to rebutting the conception that many have that this is a slower form of inflection of harm. It's just not the same as carpet bombing the place. Even though you're immediately inflicting acute food insecurity on 2 million people in Gaza, it's not the same as the kinetic attacks, which are killing fewer people than that. That's a misconception. They're both wrong. There's, I'm, I'm not trying to at all diminish the harm associated with the kinetic attacks, but it's partly about raising awareness of what the degree of suffering is associated with the former wrong and why it's a crime, so as to then mobilize publics to make their politicians see this as a politically salient issue and act on the public stage internationally. Thank you. Um, so, no, just a question on, um, we are in an innovation center. So, uh, and in the humanitarian system, we have a lot of uh, big data, um, uh, well, data collection systems, no? So my question is, uh, do you think that these new technologies and uh, all data collected through different organizations can be used somehow uh, to initiate some some kind of uh, accountability uh, process? Uh, yeah, so you. it's clearly the case that digital evidence of various forms, including big data, 
can be relevant in criminal cases, certainly at the front end where you're talking about arrest warrants, where the arrest warrants threshold is, is there reason to believe this person committed that crime? It's not beyond reasonable doubt. We're just trying to get to there's reason to believe that they did. And then we can move to the next stage, but also potentially even in the final outcome, a prosecutor is trying to build a wall of evidence to get beyond a reasonable doubt. Each component is a brick in that wall. And so big data, open source information, digital evidence can absolutely be bricks in that wall. Whether you can get the whole wall through that kind of information, I think is more complicated, but it's certainly, that's those can be bricks. And when you're thinking about that kind of evidence, you want to think about well, what exactly you're trying to show. You want to show who was doing it, what were they doing it, and what were they doing, how were they doing it, and why were they doing it. And if you can show any of those, then you're putting one brick in that wall. And ultimately, the prosecutor has to show all of them. So they have to show there was deprivation of indispensable objects. It was done for sustenance, to deny sustenance value, or in the knowledge that starvation would result as a final outcome. It was done in the context of armed conflict, etc. What was the mode of deprivation? Any data, any digital evidence that goes to any of that, whether it's the communications that established that the who was not just the person at the checkpoint denying humanitarian access, but the person giving them orders or responding to questions about that, whether it's a question of which trucks were turned back when or where they were, or when there's lack of information as to what exactly is getting through and how is it getting through and with what constraints, all of that information is relevant, or whether it's information on the effect side, when we're thinking about knowing starvation is going to occur as a virtual certainty, do we know what the level of food insecurity in the particular situation is? Do the people who are denying access or otherwise depriving objects indispensable to civilian survival to that population know that level of food insecurity such that we can establish that at a certain point they know that starvation is the inevitable consequence of these kinds of acts? Those kinds of components could absolutely be established using big data or other kinds of information or could at least partially be established. And so it could certainly be a relevant factor. And then you want to, of course, think about how you're maintaining the security of that data, how you're making sure that it is sufficiently, uh, the chain of custody is sufficiently robust that it can stand up in court, whether you need to give it early to open source investigators like Bellingcat or other kinds of actors who are professional at providing this kind of evidence to criminal prosecution and maintaining it in the appropriate ways and so on. And there are all sorts of questions around privacy and, and so on that could also be implicated when, when we start to talk about humanitarian data or data about a person's health situation and so on. But yes, it can absolutely provide an important component. And there have even been situations at the International Criminal Court where digital evidence has been the primary basis for at least moving to the arrest warrant stage. Uh, hello, thanks so much. It was really, really interesting. I don't know if I'm going to be able to to address my question well, but I will go, I will try to do it because I'm not a legal person, so it's not easy for me. Uh, from what I understood from your talk and your answer to Dalia, I, I see that we have uh, decent uh, international laws, but the problem is on how we apply that, those laws. I'm talking in the case of Gaza specifically. Um, and from what you answer, uh, is the uh, national or maybe international governments at multilateral organizations that can activate those international, let's say, systems? Is there any way uh, in which civil society or other forms of organization can activate that international uh, systems? Because I think for the specific situation of Gaza is what is really frustrating right now. That I see a lot of, at least in, from my point of view, I see a lot of movement uh, in civil society, but at the same time, I see a lot of impotence. I mean, like many different fora and they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how can they um, connect each other. Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of layers to what civil society can do in response to a situation like that. One is just to pile pressure on their governments to take a stance. So in the immediate aftermath of October 7th, where there were clear crimes against humanity and war crimes committed by Hamas and other Palestinian militant groups, that's not ambiguous. There was initially a fairly robust solidarity, certainly among Western governments with Israel, 
But as the situation has developed, that started to shift in some states. So whether it's Belgium pledging 5 million euros to the International Criminal Court, whether it's Ireland, Switzerland, Liechtenstein coming out and explicitly endorsing the ICC investigation, whether it's uh, South Africa, Djibouti, Bangladesh, Bolivia, and Comoros coming out and referring the situation to the ICC in a multi-state referral. We've only had two before that. One of them was Ukraine, the other was Venezuela. So those acts of solidarity all start to basically put pressure on either the ICC in the case of that multi-state referral or civil society putting pressure on their governments that then come out and explicitly endorse a particular posture. Even in the United States, where there's not been nearly sufficient pushback against the way that Israel is conducting the war, there has been more pushback than in any other conflict involving Israel from the United States. And I think that's partly driven by, certainly in the younger generation, the significant outrage at what's been happening and the way that Biden has had to respond to that and adjust his political position. It's not adequate. It's not stopping what's going on, but it's clearly a shift in posture and they're getting increasingly uncomfortable. So it's partly about that kind of domestic pressure working within. There's also the possibility of contributing evidence directly to the ICC or to other evidence gathering bodies. So this goes back to this earlier question, which is where civil society actors have evidence, whether it's because they're on the ground, they have video footage, or because they have information about communications that have been sent to humanitarian organizations by the Israeli military regarding what's possible and what's not, or what they'll allow and what they won't. Those kinds of information, those kinds of pieces of evidence can themselves be submitted. Now, of course, in the case of humanitarian actors, this gets very complicated because part of the posture of humanitarian actors is to maintain neutrality, impartiality, independence, so as to gain access. So it's not always going to be the case that that's the right strategy for any particular organization. It has to be organization by organization, evaluation of when the right point is to break out of that mold and say, yes, we want access and therefore we need to work with these parties, but there's a point at which we just can't sustain this tolerance of the intolerable anymore and we're going to start providing information but many organizations are just going to say that we're never going to reach that point because we have to try and maintain engagement but for those civil society organizations that are willing to engage in that they can provide evidence directly to the icc there's a portal for the provision of evidence on the icc website or to other actors that are engaged in investigations and then finally and this varies from state to state used to be the case in Spain, if I understand the, the situation in the 1990s, civil society actors in certain jurisdictions can drive the criminal case, can bring the criminal case to the investigative judge who then has to respond to their request with respect to whether to bring a case forward. And so they can start to try and drive that kind of investigation. It's complicated with universal jurisdictions, certainly after the experience of Belgium and Spain in the 1990s, many states pulled, pulled back from that. But there are still states today where that's at least potentially possible. And it's even more possible if it's not a universal jurisdiction case, but it's a case under complicity for arms sales, for example. So you're not bringing it against an Israeli official, but you're bringing it against a, an official of a state that is providing arms to Israel in a context in which it's known that they'll be used for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and so on. When exactly that threshold is breached is complicated, and so far cases along those lines haven't been particularly successful, but that's another possibility okay uh, i think there is a question on the screen i cannot read from here <laughs> lisa could you could you read that question please i don't know if this was asked before if we lost the connection for a moment, <clears throat> given that we can be more effective if we focus on identifying the act of deprivation and therefore the order, what could be the role of neutral and impartial humanitarian NGOs in advocating for the accountability of the crimes? That's the question. Yeah, so I, I mean, it goes back to the discussion we were just having because neutral and impartial humanitarian organizations have a dilemma here and it's a dilemma they've always had it's not unique to this it's also in the case for example of the icrc which has the ability to visit detainees a unique ability to visit detainees and therefore can be uniquely witness to torture or other mistreatment and has to always make a call at the point at which it 
speaks out against that and then potentially loses its unique ability to access those detainees because the detaining authorities shut down that access or tries to maintain access to those detainees and works in a uh, covert manner or in a, a, a non-open manner with respect to trying to convince that detaining authority to improve its treatment. Those kinds of dilemmas are rife for humanitarian organizations all the time. And it's no less the case here where a humanitarian organization is trying to access a population in order to maximize the likelihood of accessing that population or to maintain minimal and insufficient access, such as the access we're seeing right now in Gaza, where there is some access now. There wasn't for the first two weeks. Now there is. It's woefully inadequate. But if a humanitarian organization that's getting some of that access speaks of out of against this as a continued policy of sustenance denial or starvation of civilians as a method of warfare, it's much less likely to continue to get the minimal access it's getting. So for humanitarian organizations, that's just a dilemma. And different organizations solve it in different ways in terms of establishing how deeply embedded the ethic of impartiality and neutrality is to their identity and their efficacy and their role within that system. And the key point is that different organizations play different roles. So the ICRC has traditionally stuck a very strong position on neutrality, impartiality, and independence, and has even gained for itself certain immunities against being subpoenaed to international courts as witnesses to war crimes because of this unique role. Other organizations don't take that same posture and are ready to speak out earlier and are ready to articulate what they see as a policy of sustenance denial or whatever it is, and or sustenance denial, we're talking about the crime that's at issue right now, but any other crime. And for any humanitarian organization, it's basically a choice at the point at which they think speaking out is the right policy and the point at which they think trying to maximize impartiality and access is the right policy. And I don't think there's a wrong answer to that. Different organizations are going to play that differently. And it's necessary to have both kinds of organizations in this space, the ones that are speaking out and are really advocating for accountability and the ones that are trying to get as much access as they can and trying to stay as neutral as possible with respect to every issue precisely so as to facilitate that access. But it's notable in the context of Gaza that even the ICRC has spoken out in a way that is really quite rare for that organization. And so there are red lines for everyone and the question is just where you draw them. But I don't think there's a blanket answer to that question. It really depends on the organization in particular. And again, what, what we're looking for is is there deprivation of food, water, and other indispensable objects? A, is it for sustenance value? Is it to deny sustenance value? B, if yes, then we're in the prohibited category. If no, then we want to know what's the likely consequence. Is it going to reach the level of starvation or not? And those are the things that humanitarian actors in any given situation may be aware of or not, depending on what information they have. I would like to ask you, how will you evaluate the work of United Nations in Gaza, especially with regard to children's rights? To children's rights? Yes. Well, I mean, the, the, the situation of children in Gaza is, I mean, it's just astonishingly depressing. The, the scale of killing and the scale of children who are wounded without surviving family and the destruction of educational institutions, it's horrific. I think in this particular moment right now, it's difficult to lay the blame for that at the foot of the United Nations. Um, so in terms of the work of the United Nations and its Responsibility for children's rights in Gaza. I think they're speaking out as they should speak out. The situation is unlike anything we've seen in terms of the infliction of suffering on children in a short space of time in a particular armed conflict and the proportion of that suffering or death that's been inflicted on children. But I personally don't see it, although children's rights is not my core area of expertise, I personally don't see it as fundamentally a failing of the United Nations 
so much as the way that the war is being conducted, which is more or less outside of the hands of the United Nations. But other people may have different views on that, and it's partly because that's not the core area on which I uh, I research. I will take advantage to be here also to pose a question because uh, you were mentioning before uh, the dilemma mm -hmm. that humanitarian organizations do have in order to how to address this topic. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, Action X Hunger is uh, uh, mainly and, and I would say exclusively working towards keeping and increasing the access in order to increase the protection of those uh, 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 essential rights uh, of uh, protected by the IHL on the ground. So in that sense, my question is, how feasible you see the cohabitation, the complementarity between uh, measures such as humanitarian diplomacy, negotiation, uh, which is uh, another track that could be perfectly uh, marked or framed uh, inside of the AHL uh, and vis-a-vis -vis the uh, more jurisdictional, jurisdictional and prosecutory uh, alley. How feasible is this cohabitation or how is this possible to be undertaken? Thank you. It's complicated because, as I mentioned before, war crimes allow for no amnesty and they have no statute of limitations. And so once a particular threshold has been passed such that war crimes are implicated, there is no longer any room for negotiation with respect to accountability from the perspective of the law. The law doesn't recognize the possibility of granting amnesty at that point or negotiating back from the level of criminality. And so for organizations that are trying to engage in negotiation before the point at which the criminal threshold is passed, then there's, I think, complementarity between these two, because it can be a point on the table in that negotiation to say, here's the kind of access we want, here's, here's what we need, here's how you can do it, here's how it's compatible with your military imperatives and so on. And by the way, at a certain point, this is going to raise legal problems for you. And here's where that point is. Once the situation has gone past that point, then the compatibility of these two tracks becomes more complicated because at that point, the individual in question or the, the group of individuals in question are already facing the prospect of criminal liability. And then there's the question of how do you negotiate with respect to access on that front? I think the most sensible way to think about it is even though as a technical matter, there's no possibility of amnesty and no negotiation back from the legal threshold at that point, as a practical matter, the likelihood of prosecution is far less if there's a reversal and bringing into what would have been compliance in the first instance. So the way I think about it in the current context is, on my analysis, when Yav Galan issued his order on the 9th of October, no food, no water, no fuel, no electricity. At that moment, the war crime was already implicated because that was a policy of sustenance denial. As soon as that order was effective, as soon as they were cutting everything off, and it was clearly with a view to also cutting off food and water, which just are sustenance. There was no claim that food can be weaponized in this context or performing some other kind of military use. It was being denied as sustenance. That was unambiguous. So in my view, the war crime attached at that moment. But if five days later pursuant to, say, US pressure, they had reversed and said, no, we're op opening full humanitarian access, not just in Rafah, but also across the crossings in Israel that are most important for the delivery of humanitarian access. That crime would never have been prosecuted. And so there's a possibility, even past the war crimes threshold, of still having that space of negotiation and engagement, recognizing that legal thresholds, although they're absolute, allow for some discretion on the part of prosecutors and investigators. And so there's still some space. Once one's at a certain point, though, that there's just an inherent tension between the two. And of course, one can continue to push and try and achieve access, but one no longer has a stick or a legal component that's still hanging out there because that's already implicated. And so now that's just background noise. And to a certain extent, some actors might think, well, if I'm already liable on that front, you know, what's the incentive to stop? So at that point, it can become more complicated. Does that answer your question? Yes, but it leaves a little bit like a, uh, like a, a little ground for for uh, getting some improvements so far, which is difficult for for someone like us to 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 swallow. I mean, things can be worse. So exactly. there might be some incentives, uh, perhaps depending on the 
impact of those uh, actions uh, that could be more serious, more severe treated or less severely treated, but at least to have some kind of graduality that can enable some negotiation. Because what we think that this is my personal opinion, uh, only through negotiation, we can try to have yeah. something which is going to be better, not through any other way. Yeah. So I think the two ways of graduation are, first of all, the point at which prosecution becomes likely as a discretionary matter. So even when you have the legal threshold implicated, there's a question of whether it's going to be prosecuted at the International Criminal Court that's pursuant to a, a threshold of gravity. So, in, and this is required under Article 17 of the ICC statute, there has to be a certain level of gravity reached even when crimes are implicated. And so if one can pull back from that level of gravity, then the prosecutor is just not going to bring the case. The case could be brought in another jurisdiction, the legal threshold is crossed, but the likelihood of prosecution is lower. And the second component is the sentencing and the implications for punishment following any particular prosecution. And there too, there's possibility of graduality or graduation across time. But it's also the case that on that front, there is not a uh, sentencing regime in international criminal law that requires certain sentences at certain levels of gravity. There's just discretion on the part of judges. So it's difficult for humanitarian organizations to really raise that as something that's yeah. that's clearly within their authority or control. Thank you. Uh, Jasmine, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for this very interesting uh, insight. I just wanted to go back to the uh, question on the neutrality, uh, just to say that the neutrality of the ICRC, as you have mentioned, is exceptional. It's not the same for all other organizations, and indeed, each organization should have um, its own uh, role. So there is more room to pressure governments and actors to hold uh, Israel accountable for a potential uh, crime committed. So maybe if we go back to the question of what are the mechanisms and the type of evidence that is admissible, uh, I think this is the core question. And then to go to the question of denying acts as a result of speaking out, shouldn't it be assessed as a violation in itself? And I have a specific question. You mentioned uh, if starvation is a known consequence. Um, while maybe I don't see it uh, very ambiguous, but just from a legal perspective, how do we prove the claim that starvation was a known uh, consequence? Yeah, great. So um, let me go in reverse order. So on the question of um, starvation is a known consequence, the standard that's been set at the International Criminal Court is whether it was a virtual certainty that this was going to occur. In other jurisdictions, it's been set at a lower level, something more like a recklessness standard, accepting a substantial and unjustifiable risk. So there are different thresholds in different jurisdictions, but the ICC is a virtual certainty threshold. And if you're looking at it in the current context, one way in which it would become known is through clear information coming from sources like the United Nations, OCHA, and so on, that there is an immediate risk. The World Food Program, I think it was last Thursday, said there's an immediate risk of salvation across the population in Gaza. There's 7% of the daily minimum caloric needs getting in per uh, over the course of the um, period following the opening of the Rafa crossing. Those kinds of things will at a certain point provide sufficient information that it is known if you're continuing to impede access that starvation is going to occur as a result. And once you have people starting, die, starting to die of malnutrition, it's pretty straightforward that we're already at that stage. So the more information there is about that and the more clear it is that that information is available to those who are engaged in the impediment of relief, the easier it is to establish that that threshold is crossed. But I agree with you that the easier threshold is where you can show that it's deliberate sustenance denial, because in my view, at that point, you don't have to show that this is causing a particular outcome or that it's known that it will cause a particular outcome. The crime inheres in the deliberate sustenance denial. That's more straightforward, precisely because it doesn't raise these questions of causation. And as we were mentioning earlier, 
causation in these kinds of contexts can often be very complicated because there are multiple different variables at play. Uh, I think this was one of the other questions was about admissibility of evidence. So this varies again from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And we have the International Criminal Court. We also have domestic courts that can exercise universal or other forms of extraterritorial jurisdiction. And different courts in different systems have different standards for what evidence is admissible or not. The gold standard is first person witness testimony or information or videoing alongside documentation at the time where that individual is also available as a witness to testify. But there are all sorts of gradations below that. And the question of whether any one of those is admissible in a particular court is gonna be dependent on the nature of that court. Many systems have a quite capacious standard for the admissibility of evidence, but weigh that evidence differently in terms of its probative value, depending on the degree to which it's first person clear in terms of its chain of custody and so on versus evidence that is less directly implicating a particular element of the crime from a first person perspective. And so you want the evidence to be as clear as possible from a first person perspective. You want it to be documented and dated and stored in a way that's robust and not subject to manipulation. There are various, and I'm not technologically competent, so I'm not going to speak to exactly what these techniques are, but there are techniques to try and establish the robustness of digital evidence in terms of it not having been manipulated and using those kinds of techniques and storage systems and so on is something that you'd want to do if you want your evidence to be admissible in all jurisdictions. Um, but it's not going to be a, it's, there's not a universal standard of the admissibility threshold because it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Then there was a third question, I think, which was maybe about um, the question of whether stopping access because an organization is speaking out as a violation in and of itself. I think you're correct to say that if that's the sole reason for stopping a particular organization from delivering, then there would be a problem with that form of deprivation. And it could potentially be understood to be deprivation as part of the starvation method. The difficulty is, though, that it's going to be very complicated to show in any particular context why a particular organization is being obstructed in that moment when it's that organization and not all other organizations that are being obstructed. And so from a practical perspective, even though you're right that humanitarian organizations would, to a certain extent, have the law on their side that they shouldn't be being obstructed simply for speaking out from a practical, practical perspective, many of them will fear that consequence and rightly so from a practical perspective and therefore they have to make an evaluation of the point at which that is the correct trade-off to make but I totally agree with your first point that different organizations play different roles the ICRC is on the extreme end of that spectrum in terms of impartiality and neutrality and there's a whole spectrum from that through to pure advocacy organizations and any given organization just has to decide where it sits on that spectrum and it's i think a virtue to have a spectrum there because we need all of these different kinds of organizations operating in these spaces so i wouldn't say to any particular organization you've got it wrong you need to be somewhere else on that spectrum i think the spectrum is itself a useful thing thank you very much another question first of all Thank you for the speech. Second, um, can I ask you a question not related with the use of starved people uh, as a war weapon, but related with Palestinian-Israel conflict? Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you about the situation of freedom of speak in the university in the United States right now. And I also want to ask you about the, the situation of John Mersheimer after he published the book, The Israel Lobby, in 2007. And I don't know what happened with him and Harvard, but I want to ask you if you can explain the situation. So I can't explain his particular situation. I just don't know exactly what happened. Okay. With respect to free speech on American universities or, or on university campuses, I think there are 
clearly indicia of significant concern on that front that the university has to be a space in which students and faculty are able to articulate views without those views being uh, suppressed because of the content of the views, at least before the content becomes insightful or otherwise subject to regulation under ordinary free speech limitations. And there are some indications in some universities that precisely that is not currently the way that this debate is being governed. And that's deeply concerning. And I think it's as concerning with respect to students as with respect to faculty. And in particular, I think students should be allowed to say things that are even completely wrong and you know, ill-informed and potentially uh, inflammatory when they fall below the level of incitement or hate speech, because that's part of the learning process and that's part of the academic deliberation and debate. And so it's important to maintain that space for engaging in that speech. And I certainly would be very disappointed if my own university started clamping down on some of that speech in the way that some other universities have or seem to have done. Thank you. But I can't speak to their specific policies because a lot of, in terms of, you know, exactly what they've done, because a lot of the information is partial and there's, you know, I, I need to look at any specific instance to say, well, that's clearly a violation, but there are absolutely reasons for concern. There's no question about that, I think. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, I will have a very brief question. It's about the role of Egypt, because we mentioned about the responsibility of third state, example, with the arms support. But in the case of Gaza, for the moment, the Rafa border is open mm -hmm. on one way only. So if tomorrow there is a massive movement of population and the access to uh, the Sinai is denied, what will be the responsibility of Egypt in that case? And also if also Egypt will decide to send truck uh, directly to Gaza without going through the uh, check of Israel as it is so far, would we be also the right things to do or somehow they would be legally protected somehow? The, the last part would it be the last the right question would be to not do... to go to bypass the Israeli yeah, control yeah. and to go and to take the decision to really open the border and to let the truck in. Would it be the right thing to yes. do? Is that what you're, what you're asking? I think it would be the right thing to do morally. Um, legally, the threshold at which a third actor becomes responsible, there are different thresholds at the level of state responsibility and individual responsibility. So, state responsibility. The structure of this is under Article 16 of the Articles on State Responsibility that were drafted by the International Law Commission and thought to articulate customary international law. And what you're looking for is a substantial contribution by that state to the wrong. There's debate, though, as to whether that contribution has to be with the purpose of facilitating the wrong or knowing that the wrong is going to be facilitated. And that, in this case, would matter a lot because where there's knowledge, but they're not trying to facilitate the wrong, they may be even trying to move against the wrong by trying to facilitate various forms of access and so on that aren't yet being agreed to by Israel, then it gets a lot more complicated to find them responsible at a level of state responsibility. Similarly, with individual responsibility, there are two thresholds. So one threshold is that kind of purposive substantial contribution. There's another threshold which is knowing contribution, which is a lower threshold, but also typically entails lower sentencing and therefore a lower form of complicity. And both of those could be implicated. But the key question is, are they making a substantial contribution, which doesn't need to mean that it's a dispositive contribution, that the crime wouldn't happen without that contribution, but it does need to make it more likely than it would have been absent the contribution. And so what you'd be looking for in any given context is whether the contribution in question meets that threshold. With respect to closing the border or denying egress in a context of starvation of civilians as a method of warfare, there would be two questions. One is whether that denial of egress is that kind of substantial contribution. And uh, the other question, which I've so suddenly momentarily forgotten, I had two, two responses in mind. The other question with respect to the egress this is where the jet lag is going to start kicking in. Um, Refresh. Is... Let me just think for a second. 
the first question was, uh, if the first question was about the people uh, leaving. Yes, yeah, yeah, the people leaving. Yeah. So, if it's known that keeping, okay, so here, here's what I was going to say. The first question is, is the denial of egress itself making a substantial contribution to the starvation method? Um, and the second question is whether or not in that particular context, there's an obligation to open one's border. And that itself is a complicated question because it raises issues of sovereignty and and rights unrelated to the armed conflict. And it's also related to whether or not you understand Egypt's acts as having a belligerent nexus to the armed conflict. Because I mentioned this earlier when we were thinking about, does it have to be associated with a war? For it to be a war crime, it does have to have a nexus to the armed conflict. And when you're looking at it from Egypt's perspective of closing its border, there's a question as to whether that's an issue that's separate from the armed conflict or whether it's related to the armed conflict, whether it's shaped by and dependent upon the armed conflict. And there, there's at least a complexity with respect to understanding this as a war crime. It would, for that reason, actually be easier, probably, to establish Egyptian officials' responsibility here if you could show it's a crime against humanity or possibly even genocide, because at that point, then we move outside the domain of the armed conflict nexus. But we still face this challenge of how to understand the relationship between this act and the question of sovereignty and border control as part of sovereignty. But it's at least conceptually possible. I just don't know of another case where it would be clearly aligned with this particular framework. But clearly, I mean, obviously, the right thing to do in that context would be to let people through. Thank you. So, Tim, they are telling me that there's Tim having a question from yeah. the online. Go ahead. Just very quickly, um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I work at an organization called Insecurity Insight, where we've been documenting um, incidents directly affecting food security, such as the destruction of bakeries um, and destruction of food factories, for example, for around the past year. And I was just interested to know, um, I think it was Raphael who asked the question earlier about big data. Um, what would you say should be prioritized in terms of our documentation for supporting IHL? Thank you. Well, yeah, clearly, in some ways, when I was going through the technical debate that's been occurring with respect to encirclement and siege deprivation, part of what I was doing was trying to explain why the structure of the protection of objects indispensable to survival should inform how we understand the legal framework governing siege and encirclement deprivation. And when you're talking about attacks, destruction, or rendering useless of either food or bread factories, other kinds of bakeries, other kinds of means of the provision of food or the creation of food, then those are more straightforwardly governed by the protection of objects indispensable to civilian survival. So under that 54, 2 and 3 paradigm, it's prohibited to attack, destroy, remove or render useless such objects, either for their sustenance value or where starvation or force movement is a known consequence. So in that sense, those kinds of acts are more straightforwardly and explicitly governed by the rules protecting objects indispensable to civilian survival than is siege or encirclement, where one has to make this interpretive argument to get there. So in that sense, the kind of thing that you're describing documenting is absolutely relevant. And the key question is just why is it being destroyed? Is it is it an accidental collateral consequence of an attack on something else? Is it a context where that particular unit is being used for something other than food production? So it's being used as a command and control post, or it's being used to store weaponry and so on? Or is it just being targeted as a bakery or as a food producing facility? If it's being targeted or destroyed just as a bakery or food producing facility, then it's straightforwardly unlawful in my view. And I think that's not really ambiguous under the terms of Article 54, paragraphs two and three. If it's being targeted for other kinds of reasons, then we get into the question of whether starvation is the likely consequence, the known consequence of that. And so you'd want to know why it's being targeted. That's the key thing, in addition to the fact of it being hit that you want to try and establish. And so the more you can provide information that shows that 
that was the case, the better. And that, in a sense, makes it much easier if the thing is destroyed by a group controlling the area versus targeted by an airstrike. Because targeted by an airstrike, the question is, what were they aiming at? Maybe they weren't even aiming at that thing. Maybe they were aiming at it, but they thought it was something else. There's all sorts of complexity there. But if they came through and destroyed it, unless there's some other clear reason why they destroyed it, then you're more straightforwardly in a zone where the prohibition attaches. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's helpful. The very last short question from Christina. Uh, yeah. Mm, how could we interpret it from the law a situation in which in a conflict context, okay, maybe like bakeries are working, but the prices of food are so high that population cannot access to it. Yeah, so this is a, a situation that Yemen, for example, this became a, a key issue in that context where there was food, but it was just inaccessible to a significant portion of the population because of the price. So the, the price inflation itself makes it more complicated because, again, we're going back to these questions as to what are the actions of potential perpetrators that lead to this outcome? There are other issues that could arise in this context, economic social rights, other legal paradigms that one could apply. But if we're trying to think about it in terms of whether there's a war crime, the question is whether that is the result of either a policy of deliberate sustenance denial or a policy where starvation is the known consequence. And it's much harder in a context of price inflation, which can be caused by all sorts of factors that are not attributable to a specific actor engaged in a particular policy with respect to a specific objective and therefore much harder to prove as a matter of criminal law it could be part of it but you'd want to show that that is either an intended outcome or show that sustenance denial is part of what's causing the price inflation so it's not just that the armed conflict is creating a scarcity of food Food is therefore becoming significantly more expensive. Resources available to purchase that food are going down, and therefore there's this inaccessibility of food as an economic matter. That's not going to implicate a war crime yet. You need to show that there's either some policy of sustenance denial or something along the lines that I've been discussing earlier. And the mere high price of food is not going to be sufficient in that respect. It will implicate other kinds of questions, and it could implicate the imperative for humanitarian aid delivery, which could itself then raise questions of the kind that we were discussing earlier in terms of when that, that aid is being impeded. But the fact of the high prices of food is going to be much more complicated as a legal matter. Obviously, from a moral perspective, it shouldn't really change our thinking about the imperative and the suffering and so on. It's just that when you're trying to prove a war crime, that's going to be an intervening variable that's going to make it a lot harder to establish the criminality of a specific actor. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Really, thank you very much for being with us, taking into consideration that you slept two hours today, just arrived from Boston this morning. Showed us at a certain <laughs> point when I just malfunction well no no it was very short uh, shortcut so uh, no thank you indeed very much and thank you very much to all the questions and of course i want to please ask you for a last round of applause for tom thanking you and welcoming you back